Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. We are now at the end of our course entitled English Language and Literature and I hope it has been use, our lectures have been useful uh, to you and, uh, and also at various levels whether you are a student in an engineering college who has opted for an elective or, uh, or is in a core course okay, in English language and literature or um, whether you are a student at a higher level for instance at a postgraduate level going back to the basics. Right? So, uh, I welcome you uh, again this final time to this lecture which is entitled Cognitive Approaches to Literature. As you know we are in module 4 which is uh, or which has been dedicated to um, uh, dedicated to literary criticism. Um, we have seen or we have been through a number of lectures this module as in some of the other modules. Uh, this module is being shared by Professor Krishna Borwa and me and uh, we looked at several I must say schools of literary criticism right uh, starting with classical criticism uh, then moving on to liberal humanism marxism feminism reader response criticism new historicism eco criticism structuralism post structuralism post colonialism and finally today we are in a, in a lecture entitled cognitivism. Okay. So, this lecture is on cognitive approaches uh, to literature. It is not that um, a cognitive approach was not there you know um, in the field of literary criticism, okay. but when we say cognitive contemporary cognitive approaches to literature, we are referring to a kind of literary criticism okay, that has emanated following um, you know what many call this sort of explosion of studies from the cognitive point of view. Okay. More about this later, but again as I said the, you know, the 1990s were known as the decade of the brain right? and in a sort of systematic sort of way. Okay, the study of mind, consciousness, attention, learning, memory, okay, parts of cognition uh, were not really carried out in literary criticism. For a long time perhaps many thought that you know talking about the psychological aspects of literary texts that we were it was enough for us to understand the literary text from a Freudian point of view or more recently from a Lacanian point of view. Okay. But the cognitive approach to literary texts uh, we agree is a new approach and we shall see how it moves away or it, it goes beyond uh, the kind of psychoanalytical criticism of literary texts which we have understood till now and which was largely Freudian in its framework. Okay. So, we are really looking at a new way uh, in many ways it is uh, you know uh, a lot of work has already been done though it may not be practiced uh, in uh, uh, no, it may not be practiced uh, very widely in many countries. Okay. So, I would like to first refer to a few titles here okay, those of you who are interested by no means of course, is this an exhaustive list, but some of the pioneering works in this field are definitely Mark Turner's The Literary Mind and we will talk about The Literary Mind just in, in, in a while. There are other books that are useful for us not simply from a literary point of view. Uh, for instance, Bowden's The Creative Mind, Myths and Mechanisms. Lakoff and Johnson's Metaphors We Live By, Peter Stockwell's it's, this is more of course to do with poetics, Cognitive Poetics, Patrick Combe Hogan's The Mind and Its Stories, Mary 
cranes Shakespeare's brain. Okay. Of these, if you look at texts that are largely to do with literary studies is uh, we may re refer to Peter Stockwell and Mary Crane's books. There are as I said several works, in fact uh, uh, you know um, there are works by Turner, by Stockwell, by uh, George Lakoff among others okay, that deal also with poetic metaphors for instance. Okay. So, this is just a sample I must admit of texts that uh, you know we talk about when we talk about uh, literary criticism from a cognitive point of view. Okay. Well, let me begin with a reference to Jonathan Gottschall's literature science and a new humanities. Well, the title of his book is important in the sense that it points to a new humanities which of course, is based as the title suggests on a scientific <laughs> and systematic way of looking at texts. Right? So, let us read from this text where Gottschall has to say that the literary scholar's subject is ultimately the human mind. The mind that is the creator, subject and auditor of literary works. Now, Many schools, we have been through so many schools of literary criticism, okay. the approach, the onus, the focus in all these schools vary definitely. Marxism as we know will look at um, the largely the socio cultural, the economic and will look at the literary text as a part of um, the superstructure. Okay. Feminism will point in many different ways to issues of gender, issues of sexuality for instance. Okay. Um, post colonialism will look at the text from the point of view of colonialism and anti colonialism. Right. In today's lecture, okay, I think it is um, it is good to begin with Jonathan Gottschall's uh, you know reminder here that you know we look at the text, but do we look or how often have we looked at the mind that creates the text. Okay. So, again the literary uh, scholar subject is ultimately he says okay, the human mind, the mind that is a creator, subject and auditor of literary works and also there is the other very important um, you know aspect to cognitive literary studies is also the mind that cognizes the text, not simply the mind that creates the text, okay, but the mind that cognizes or the mind the readers, mind of the reader, okay, which is also an important aspect of cognitive literary studies. So, you can I am sure you feel right away, okay, you understand that we are moving into a realm in which the text of course, matters, but the, the creator of the text and the reader of the text are seminal in this case. Okay. It is not to say that the text per se is not important or that cognitive studies do not look at some formalist aspects of the text, okay. but it is the mind that creates which is the central focus here. Okay. So, I hope you have understood through uh, you know Gottschall's words what exactly we are looking for in a cognitive or rather the, the central point of uh, point of focus in a cognitive approach to literary texts. Then again reading from Gottschall, the primary the prime sorry activity of literary critics of all theoretical and political slants has been to pry open the craniums of characters, here of course it means the minds or the brains or the minds of characters, authors and narrators climb inside their heads and spelunk through all the bewildering complexity to figure out what makes them tick. Okay. So, again as we said uh, he, he says that well you may be from any school of or, uh, uh, literary criticism, you may be a practitioner okay, of any uh, school of literary criticism or you may have several you know different political orientations, but as he says ultimately what are we looking at? We are trying to understand the characters, we are under, trying to understand their minds, we are trying to understand authors and as readers others are also trying to understand how we as readers understand the text. Okay. Then there are these further questions that he asks. For instance, we know in Shakespeare's Hamlet that Hamlet hesitates to take revenge. Okay. We know that his 
you know he is impelled on the one hand right to uh, by by the ghost of his father to take revenge but we know he hesitates right so what is what goes on okay our curiosity definitely is what goes on in the mind of hamlet as is evidenced by the text okay uh, that that tells us why hamlet hesitates to carry out this revenge act or for instance what is Marlowe telling us about the heart of darkness? What is, what is the heart of darkness in his work by the same name, right? And why, of course, why do we respond to, such, uh, to certain situations, to certain characters, for instance, what, how, why do we respond in certain ways to Hamlet's predicament, okay? To what extent, as um, I think Coleridge put it, if I am not mistaken, okay, that we all of us have a Hamlet in us or all of us are Hamlet to a certain extent. Okay. So, why do certain characters elicit certain responses from us? Okay. Why do we identify with certain characters and, and some of their predicaments? Okay. All this has to do with mind, with, with memory, right, with understanding, with perception and hence we call it the cognitive approach to literary text. Therefore, why do we respond as we do? In short, the traditional job of literary scholars has been to explore why characters act and think as they do and to explain significances in the messages that, takes, uh, that texts convey to readers. In fact, he, the, the critic here is saying that, well, if you, uh, if you look carefully, if you consider carefully the job of reading okay, or, the, or the function that we perform when we read a text. Right, the procedures, the processes, you, we should not be surprised to discover that all this while we have been actually trying to find out, you know, certain cognitive factors. Okay. For instance, he says even the traditional job of literary criticism has been to explore, to understand our first curiosity is why does a character behave this, the way he or she does okay? and what is the significance of you know the messages that the, the text and the characters therein convey to our readers. In short, how do we cognize a literary text, cognize in all you know uh, the aspects that we may think of memory, attention, perception, etc. Right? So, well, this is uh, we have begun with his words, um, uh, you know, with a particular critic who, in fact, says that throughout, even without the cognitive revolution and the building up of a cognitive way of looking, uh, you know, cognitive science way of looking at text or approach uh, to text, okay, all even traditional ways of looking at text are basically uh, basically cognitive exercises. Okay. Now, the, uh, if you remember where we had referred to uh, Crane's important book Shakespeare's Brain and this title itself may be uh, extremely you know stimulating right, it is extremely exciting at least to me that is when we, when we entitle when one entitles a book Shakespeare's Brain then the first thing that comes to us is what kind of book is this, is this a book which you know stud is a neuroscientific study of Shakespeare's brain. Okay. What are we to expect from such a book? Right? The, the argument that uh, Mary Crane gives is not an argument from neuroscience. Okay? Uh, the appeal may be to certain findings in cognitive sciences about or about the brain, but of course, it is a text from literary criticism. Let us read a very brief extract or a paragraph from her book and we shall find out what is going on in such a book. Crane says, and I quote, Shakespeare provides a particularly appropriate test case for a literary theory that purports to offer a new way, look at this, a new way of con conceiving authorship, especially one that challenges the Foucauldian deconstruction of the author in several ways. Okay? In our lecture on post-structuralism, Right. We saw very clearly the attack on the whole concept of, you know, of an author as sort of the creator of a text, okay, as the author as the, you know, the origin of a text. Right. We saw through Foucault, through, through Derrida, uh, you know, through Roland Barthes, for instance, when we came across the famous um, 
sort of dictum, if you may, if you may use the word, the death of the author, right? So Crane says that well, this goes beyond and challenges such notions of the death of the author, okay, where language is supreme, where the creator is language and not a flesh and blood person. And she says that well, Shakespeare is uh, one of the best examples uh, for us to understand or to raise new questions of authorship as she says here to offer a new way of conceiving authorship that is based on uh, you know based on how the mind creates a text okay how you know or, or based on the mind of the author right so many to many critics this cognitive way of looking or cognitive approach to a literary text is the next big thing right after high theory as many put it, after the theories of deconstruction of post structuralism in general and post modernism may be uh, to an extent in general and to really bring the text as it were back to the flesh and blood author. So, let us read this quickly again Shakespeare provides a particularly appropriate test for a lit test case for a literary theory that purports to offer a new way of conceiving authorship especially one that challenges the Foucauldian deconstruction of the author in several ways. A focus, she says next, a focus on Shakespeare's brain allows us to attend to Shakespeare as an author, right. A focus on Shakespeare's brain allows us to attend to Shakespeare as an author without losing the complexity authored by contemporary theory. This is again very important. This is not a going back. Okay, is not a simple going back to older theories or you know um, or even to you know autobiographical uh, literary criticism as we have understood it so far. Okay, she says that uh, looking at Shakespeare's brain that is through the text, of course, looking at Shakespeare's brain, looking at Shakespeare as the the author of the works that he. Uh, it has created the works that are attributed to him, okay. notwithstanding of course, all the debate that goes on about whether Shakespeare really was the author or whether there were several authors or some other author, we are not looking at those, but you know the cognitive approach, the beauty in the cognitive approach lies in this that it does not do away with you know the, the complexities and the problematical issues that have come up after you know the uh, you know uh, after the coming in of theory right of basically language based uh, theory that uh, you know um, uh, the both like structuralism and post structuralism that have for uh, you know for uh, for all time to come really changed what literary criticism is okay so understanding shakespeare as the, an author as a real author okay attributing the text back to him does not do away with the complexity offered by contemporary theory. And this is really the beauty so that so much so that today you have uh, post structuralist cognitive approaches to literature, you have Marxist uh, cognitive approaches to literature, okay. you have feminist cognitive approaches to literature. These which means that this approach is extremely varied, okay. I would say it is extremely encompassing and uh, accommodating and not losing out on what previous theories have, if I may say, worked hard to offer us about the text, right. So, using a cognitive literary, literary and cultural theory derived from the cognitive sciences, she says, attempts to reintroduce into serious critical discourse a consideration of Shakespeare's brain as one material side. This cognitive literary theories also, this kind of um, talking about authorship is also known as a new materialism okay, or a new embodied way of looking at the text as one material site for the production of dramatic works attributed to him. Now, again let us read what she says, in many ways Shakespeare's plays are much about the coming into being of cognitive subjects, this is beautifully put. We may look and reinterpret Okay. Shakespeare's plays as you know the coming into being of cognitive subjects. Okay. So, the characters may be looked from the point of view of 
uh, you know of many of the tools, theories, propositions and suggestions that are given has been has been given to us by uh, cognitive theories following the decade of the brain. Okay. So, in many ways as she says the plays are as much about the coming into being of cognitive subjects in a variety of environments as they are about the construction of cultural subjects by a variety of discursive formations. Okay. This is important. We saw um, you know in that literary theory and cultural studies at least cultural studies as we understand uh, you know the domain as um, not as a study of culture really, but as you know um, an analysis of culture as a text an analysis of um, that is based on uh, you know on a structuralist and post structuralist uh, orientation. Okay. So, uh, she says that of course, the texts may be read and are considered as you know as the cons how, how, the su how subjects how subjectivity or identity okay, of characters for instance in a text are um, you know um, caused by a variety of discourses a variety of ways of talking about things a variety of discursive formations. But she says that at the same time we may also look at for instance Macbeth we can look at um, uh, Hamlet for instance as the development of a cognitive subject okay as she says the coming into being of cognitive subjects okay which again let me remind you does not do away with all the complexities that have been brought to our notice complexities of text of character of subjectivity that have been brought to importantly brought to our notice by cultural criticism um, you know and language based criticism okay the then she says that the plays represent what it is like Okay. These words are extremely important, please pay attention. The plays represent what it is like to conceive of oneself as an embodied mind along with all the problems and dilemmas that condition entails okay. and we shall look at this later. Contemporary cognitive science uh, uh, some of um, you know uh, some of the, the, the postulates are based on a very important departure from you know the uh, the old Descartian way of looking at the mind and body as two different uh, entities from, from what we call Cartesian dualism to an understanding of the mind in the body to an understanding as the mind emanating from the body not at all you know different from the body. The question of embodiment is an important question and cognitive literary criticism has much to, you know, there is so much promise here really in you know when you try to when you realize that the whole you know the uh, uh, a whole uh, new approach grows when you look at um, the characters as embodied beings okay and you skim the text or you search the text for references to embodiment and you begin to understand the characters themselves as, as Mary uh, Crane has put it as coming into being as cognitive subjects particularly from an embodied perspective. Okay. So, uh, this is again uh, definitely a new way of looking at literary texts. Now, Okay. Now, let us look at now we of course, talked about the theoretical part of it. Now, let us look at an instance that is given to us by the critic. right? So, uh, we will look at an analysis of remember our quest one of our questions was why uh, does Hamlet hesitate, right? why does Hamlet hesitate to kill uh, Claudius his uncle who is married his uh, mother after having killed uh, you know uh, Hamlet's father right? and it is it should be uh, uh, really uh, it should not be a very difficult task for Hamlet to take revenge or to avenge his father's death. Right? But we know that Shakespeare gives us a character uh, who, who hesitates okay? the delay question in Hamlet is a central question of the text why does Hamlet delay the killing of Claudius. Okay? Now, how is this to be answered from a cognitive point of view as given to us in books like Shakespeare's brain. Okay, now, let us look at this. Why does Hamlet not act? Now, this again I have taken from the text in question. The play on several levels makes us question the nature of action. Okay. This of course, so many critics have done those of you I have you know have worked on or who, ha who are in 
um, say the graduate or postgraduate levels, you are you under you um, you know that uh, the you know act, uh, ha, the 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 fact that Hamlet doesn't act, okay, action and inaction are you know um, uh, is a core binary in you know in Shakespeare's Hamlet, right? And so many critics have talked about the nature of action also from a philosophical perspective. What is it to act, right? to be and not to be that is the question is also interpreted in so many ways uh, and among them is to act or not to act right. But how is this difference in different in this case let us look at this the play on several different levels this is how a cognitivist like Mary Crane would argue the play on several different levels makes us question the nature of action which I said many have already done, but by using a different we may even say approach or methodology if I may use the word okay. by pro focusing on the processes behind it this is very important. Okay. The nature of action which has hitherto been dealt with from a philosophical point of view from other points of view from a psychoanalytical point of view okay, um, is now understood or sought to be understood by looking at the very processes that lie behind it. Okay. Now, let us read on further Hamlet centers around two insistent questions Now this is the way the analysis is being done Hamlet centers around two insistent questions what do human subjects have within this is important. Okay. What number one what do human subjects have within the, or we say the inner world of human subjectivity in general and how is that inner self the second question how is that inner self related to the external or related to external action in the world right. So, now you see moving on from a purely philosophical perspective what is being done here is we are talking about subjectivity from a cognitive perspective and importantly the processes that go on into the creation of subjectivity. Okay, in a given point of time in time and space right. What do human subjects have within and second how is that inner subject or inner subjectivity or inner self as she puts it okay. How is it related to external action in the world you follow. So, you understand that the, the it is a, it's the nature of the mind that is central here not the nature of action this is immensely important. Remember before this what critics were doing were well, we are looking at trying to understand action as I said from several perspectives including the philosophical. Here what is happening is we are looking at as she puts it external action in the world okay, by focusing on the inner world or the inner self right. So, Hamlet's hesitance Hamlet's delay in acting in the play is to be understood first from how Hamlet A cognizes right his inner self okay, how he understands himself okay. and we have to look uh, at the soliloquies the dialogues you know different events and episodes in the text uh, from the point of view of the, the, the cognitive processes that are going inside Hamlet's mind and of course, it is a it is really a uh, uh, one of the best texts for us because uh, you know if not for other reasons so many the so many soliloquies and you know the so many reflective uh, sort of um, uh, uh, you know parts of the text that allow us to have a look at what is going on in Hamlet's mind do you follow ok. So, uh, then second Hamlet understanding ok or Hamlet's understanding of action in the external world Okay, outside of himself or outside of his subjectivity again in relation to his inner self. Now, do you follow this is the change we get in focus when we look at Hamlet from a cognitive perspective. So, again Hamlet centers around says Mary Crane to insistent questions what do human subjects have within and how is that inner self related to external action in the world. The play considers these issues not just directly in speeches and soliloquies as we said just a while ago ok speeches soliloquies uh, even asides ok these are uh, direct indicators of the state of mind uh, of a character 
Okay? And uh, well, for those who can look carefully at it, also at the processes that go on inside the character's mind, right? there are indicators, these are clear direct indicators. But um, you know, says the critic that the play Hamlet, the Hamlet considers this or gives us this issues in obviously in speeches and in asides and in soliloquies, but she says it is important for us okay, to also see what is being you know told, what is being indicated however indirectly okay, through the structure of the text. Right? She, she says here also structurally in the organization, in the plot structure for instance of, of the, the play, okay, in its organization um, around poles of inside and outside, in its delaying plot and in its representation of character. Do you follow? So, again structure, plot, organization of plot in relation to a different set of binary opposites and this set is that of the inner world and the outer world as she says here of outside and inside. And as I said the indicators are also to be found in the outside not simply in the subjectivity of the character which is obviously uh, you know um, very well evidenced by soliloquies etcetera right. But structurally how the plot is organized around the binary the core binary of inside and outside gives us an understanding or an explanation so to speak or analysis of the delay in the text as far as action is concerned and in its representation of character. Why I have brought this example you know um, this analysis is because I want you to understand that this whole business of doing a cognitive approach is not just is not a neuroscientific approach. Okay, we are not looking at Shakespeare's brain really, the physical brain of Shakespeare, it's not simply because we do not have it with us, but it is a very rich okay? and to me personally you know it is really one of the richest ways or that one can look at a text right. And in this case in the case of Hamlet as we saw uh, earlier approaches you know to action and inaction okay, sociological, um, psychoanalytical. Okay, or philosophical okay, uh, is given another very important trust through the cognitive aspect okay, of looking at for instance uh, understanding the text uh, through uh, or by putting subjectivity okay, and you know opposites like binary opposites like inside and outside at the center of the critical enterprise. right? A cognitive, then she says a cognitive Hamlet, look at the it is so beautifully put a cognitive Hamlet or a cognizing Hamlet okay, as a character, a cognitive Hamlet who binds himself up in a tangle of imagined look at this imagined inner processes right, is no less tragic than a politically or psychologically crippled prince. All you know this while we have looked at Hamlet from a, definitely from a political angle, from a psychological angle and we have seen the what we call the predicament or the dilemma of this brooding prince. Okay. So, she says that a cognitive Hamlet is no less tragic than a political Hamlet or as she says here a psychological Hamlet. Right? A cognitive Hamlet or understanding Hamlet's mind from a cognitive pers perspective elicits the same amount of you know um, or same amount of tragedy of tragic circumstances of empathy in us right and in some cases of course of identification in us uh, with hamlet okay uh, in as strong ways as a political interpretation of hamlet would suggest okay fine so this is uh, well in the beginning one example that we have seen of you know um, an enriched and enriching way of looking at a literary text. So, now we are going to go back to ask very fundamental questions for instance what is cognitive science we know this is uh, the kind of literary criticism we are talking about emanates from uh, a new way of looking at phenomena which is known as the cognitive science enterprise okay, one of the most important paradigms 
um, in all uh, branches of knowledge be it computation, philosophy, anthropology, literary text etcetera. Okay. We understand cognitive science in very simple, a very simple and elementary way as a study of mind okay, and intelligence from and this is extremely important from an interdisciplinary perspective. There is no A or one framework through which we understand mind and intelligence. The very you know the very nature of cognitive science is, is that it is not simply cognitive psychology okay, nor is it just uh, simply the uh, you know a theory of mind right. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary and by its very nature that is why we call it an interesting complex enriched domain. Okay, that has so many disciplines that come together to give it an, uh, a very important right, interdisciplinary thrust. So, cognitive science is known as the interdisciplinary study of mind and intelligence. We call this you know we call, uh, we call this a cognitive revolution really and that, that referred to the 1990s as being known as the decade of the brain. Some of uh, you know um, some of very uh, some of the very important uh, research findings coming through neurosciences for instance okay or also looking not just neurosciences looking at the brain from several perspectives so the cognitive revolution in essence is a revolution that has come about following the theories and models proposed on human information processing okay in in a in a, in a to put it very simply really cognitive science would look at the mind as a set of information processing machines or modules right. Uh, information human information processing is the core lies at the core of the cognitive revolution. Whether you understand human uh, information processing in terms of uh, you know the brain as a wet computer uh, or with inputs and outputs okay. Uh, looking at the brain as the hardware, the mind as the software etcetera and all the metaphors that come with it or you are looking at human information processing from other uh, you know from other frameworks. The point important point is at the core of the cognitive science revolution okay, at least as it began now let me qualify it by saying it is not that the mind as a human you know information processing machine it is not that it has not been contested or challenged, but it began if we may put it safely by looking at the mind as a wet computer by looking at the mind as a set of information processing machines. The computer therefore, became a metaphor for the human brain okay, following the beginning of this revolution the, and human memory was understood as a storage and retrieval system and one of the most important questions here was the mind brain relation and asking questions like what is the mind and as one of my students says in class can we even say or pose a question like what is the mind if the brain is everything. Okay. And of course, finally the growth of evolutionary psychology becoming in, in a very strong way okay, and, the, and of course, the establishing and the fact that it has it is here to stay okay, the understanding of our present psychological propensities, our present psychological endowments, tendencies okay, by looking at how the mind had developed in evolution. Okay. So, evolutionary psychology is almost like what we call reverse engineering looking at the present human mind trying to understand its design and structure also you know the, the, the design and structure of the mind that leads or that can create a literary text. right? So, these are some of the ways in which we may begin to define what cognitive means and uh, or at least what cognitive uh, you know means as a framework of understanding and, um, and analysis. So, therefore, we have a new paradigm right in also in literary studies not just in literary studies of course, everywhere where we, we call it a you know a, a huge shift a paradigm shift right. Um, and as some scholars put it, there is this, this appropriation of the findings of cognitive science by literary studies. Okay. It is wrong to, to assume, uh, it is wrong to assume that cognitive science has sort of subsumed or, or has appropriated literary studies. It is quite the other way around. Okay. Findings from suggestions from cognitive science are being appropriated by literary studies. Of course, by some critics in a bid to uh, sort of um, redeem ourselves as many would put it 
uh, from the impasse that has been created by deconstruction by post structuralism and to have a new a new material okay uh, if not biological uh, basis for the understanding of the creative mind the mind that creates the literary text and the mind that receives or responds to the literary text the minds of the characters therein right so therefore we call it an appropriation of cognitive science findings at least by literary studies so we then call the imagination a biologic or a biological imagination okay the even imagination the obviously is something that emanates from the brain right so human beings of course are organic beings right they are complex organic beings and they are cognitive agents the imagination is embodied it comes from the mind from the from the brain the body okay and this has quite you know uh, successfully spells you could say the final doom if we may use the word the final doom of cartesian dualism okay that cartesian dualism rene descartes who suggested was known as a first modern philosopher uh, you know the very famous statement that we have from him cogito ergo sum or i think therefore i am the importance of reason okay the beginning of modern uh, uh, you know of modern philosophy but here this sounds really the death knell of cartesian dualism because it understands the mind as embodied the mind is coming from the brain and the body so um just skip this slide uh, alan richardson in um, philosophy and uh, you know literature in 19 uh 99 this journal the, the extremely important journal um philosophy and literature and in in an uh, in an article in uh, you know way back in 1999 alan richardson uh talks about the future of literary uh, studies in terms okay of cognitive science remember 1999 we are uh you know uh, at uh, the fag end okay of a decade that has been known that was known as a decade of the brain and richardson suggests in philosophy and literature that the future of literary studies perhaps lies in cognitive approaches to the text and to the author okay and he says here that uh, the rise of cognitive studies or cognitive approaches to literary texts uh, may have arisen with a dis what he calls a dissatisfaction with post structuralism okay this is a point we had referred to a while ago a uh, dissatisfaction with post structuralism and which aspects of post structuralism uh, those aspects which deal with relativism particularly at its relativistic and anti humanist extremes okay uh, let me quickly say what anti humanism is it doesn't mean anti humanitarian anti humanism here means uh, when we do not consider the human okay as the center of reference okay is nothing to do you know not really nothing it is not not doesn't talk about it's not about humanitarian of being human human you know being um uh, of 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 being empathetic of being altruistic etc humanism is a school of thought or an ideology if you will okay wherein the human being is the center of reference right post structuralism as we've seen in our lecture on post structural uh, structuralist criticism is a school of thought which does which is surely anti humanist in the sense that the ego is understood the human ego is understood in terms of things outside of it okay be it social structures or be it an you know be it an understanding of uh, of things from a language perspective okay where we have seen statements like the death of the author okay so there was it seems a dissatisfaction and we also know that post structuralism deconstruction have uh, also met with bad press in the sense that there are many scholars who who downright okay uh, even um, question the very validity of looking at literary text from a post structuralist relativistic anti humanist perspective okay so there was a dissatisfaction in many quarters or uh, with post structuralism and its relativist um, relativistic aspects and um Alan Richardson says that well this turn what we call the cognitive turn in literary studies may well have been kind of kind of you know it may have uh, uh, been almost fortuitous in the sense that on the one hand we had uh, the you know the 
uh, findings about the brain, a very material new materialism, a new you know a, a biologism we, we may say okay, that was coming in from the sciences and from other uh, you know uh, in a very interdisciplinary sort of way. And the time seemed to be ripe when there was a dissatisfaction with post structuralism and the need or you know so to speak to have a more tangible material uh, based uh, you know uh, approach to the literary text which was not not the Marxist literary, not only the Marxist literary text that or literary criticism that we had seen earlier. Okay. And also there he says to imagine a future after postmodernism, uh, after the you know the huge attack on enlightenment thought right, that came about with postmodernism, uh, there was also you know um, people wanted different, you know, people wanted to, to find out ways in which there was an, uh, uh, an imagining of future discourses, future frameworks without recourse uh, you know to, to words terms like discourse and discur discursive formations for instance right. Uh, they wanted to be able to imagine uh, it says imagine a future after, now what next after postmodernism, right. All this these theories talking about uh, you know uh, talking about collages, bricolages talking about um, uh, talking about relative relativism uh, talking about depthless culture right talking about floating signifiers after that what so they seem to have been by the end of uh, you know if not earlier by the end of the 20th century a hankering for a new way of looking at things that sort of would at least give us a solid ground to stand on So, then he says in areas within literary studies that most closely border on the relevant disciplines within the cognitive neurosciences particularly what are I mean what are the areas that are important here or which directly uh, refer to the cognitive neurosciences reader response criticism. Okay. So, there is a reshaping a revamping if you will of the earlier theories that we had of reader response criticism. Um, of fish of ether for instance okay and reshaping them from the point of view from the point of view of the findings of the cognitive neurosciences okay then metrics and of course narratology narratology uh, from a cognitive point of view was immensely uh, important was an immensely important revamp okay how the mind creates uh, creates stories right um, of course, we had you know Russian critics like uh, Vladimir Prop, for instance, who talked about you know the the uh, uh, 33 or so main uh, kind of uh, elements in folk tales, for instance. Okay, there were um, there were these uh, very important um, interventions made in in as far as the theories of narratology went. But there was uh, definitely new ground. Okay, now, for studying narratology, the mind that creates stories, the kinds of stories that are created by the mind. Evolutionary speaking, when did man begin to create stories okay, and myths? What was the need in that evolutionary phase to have a certain cognitive fluidity, okay, evolutionary speaking, in the mind that gave rise to stories? When did metaphor, the metaphorical imperative, begin to emerge? So, these are new ways. Uh, of asking questions, these are not old uh, questions and answers that come, these are new ways new because it comes from a new framework altogether. Then he says all but cry out for look at this look at this phrase here all but cry out for rethinking in terms of recent work in cognitive psychology, cog psycholinguistics and artificial intelligence. In artificial intelligence uh, many of you are aware that there have been um, uh, there have been serious uh, and sometimes successful attempts uh, to create computer programs right uh, that write stories to, to have certain uh, kind of uh, you know you have inventories you have certain algorithms okay, that try to sort of mimic. Uh, if I have time I shall uh, show you some of these try uh, you know this we call this automatic story generators. Okay, to have computers um, you know bring about stories and uh, or to produce stories that seem even novels that seem to have been written by human beings. Okay. This is in a bid to understand how the mind again creates stories or creates narrative to understand. Okay. So, as Richardson here says that of course, these new findings in cognitive neurosciences and in these interdisciplinary areas like um, uh, you know or, or uh, other disciplines that have come in like 
psycholinguistics, okay, like artificial intelligence and cognitive psychology, uh, gave or created an environment or um, a discursive framework, okay, uh, from which we could re, uh, you know, uh, as I said, revamp some of the older ways of looking at and answering questions about literary creativity, about reader response, etcetera. Then, uh, you remember I referred to Mark Turner and his very important book, The Literary Mind, where he, where he talks about uh, n not the literary mind as a mind that is literary, but he talks about our minds being inherently literary, okay? our minds being inherently predisposed to creating stories. Okay? So, this is another aspect or another um, way of looking um, at the mind from a cognitive science perspective that is the mind is already literary. Okay? And then he talks about um, a, what he calls a reframing of the study of English or study of English language or study of literature is what is meant here. A reframing, he says cognitive sciences has brought about a reframing of the study of English so that it seems to be seen as inseparable from the discovery of mind. Okay. Again, remember the mind here is central. The mind, its processes and its products are, uh, you know, is seen as central here. And we look at, we study the literary text, okay, understanding it and accepting the fact that, it is in that studying a literary text is inseparable from a study of the mind okay, or the discovery of the mind as he puts it. Participating and even leading that way in that discovery. This is really not a tall claim if you consider the fact that he, 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 he you know he describes defines the mind as a literary as, as being literary in the first place. So, it is not again that he is giving a different um, slant to what was said earlier by I think uh, I think Alan Richardson, when, his, uh, uh, when it was suggested that literary studies appropriates the findings from cognitive studies. What Richardson is saying here is only it, it can also be the other way around. Okay? Sometimes literary studies may also the reframing when it is reframed from a cognitive point of view may also lead, uh, you know a text like Hamlet for instance may contribute to cognitive studies. It is not just that we use the schemas from cognitive science, uh, sciences from neurosciences okay, in a bid to understand Hamlet. Right? What is suggested here is a text, a complex text like Hamlet okay, uh, and what it talks about the indicators given by the plot and the character and situations, the soliloquies as we saw earlier, okay, the asides, the speeches may also throw light on cognitive processing. Right? So, it seems it is uh, that critics are, have, have pointed to both parts of the negotiation, okay? understanding a literary text from a cognitive perspective and understanding the mind from a literary perspective. Okay? So, um, as we come to the end of this, um, uh, this lecture on cognitive sciences, is, you know, the feeling I get is we have barely begun to sort of uh, you know, scratch the surface of you know, um, the interface between cognitive sciences and literary science, the literary text, okay? the understanding of literary uh, uh, products, the understanding of characters of authors from uh, you know keeping mind and subjectivity, right? for instance, as uh, the core reference points, okay? understanding from which from you know the center from which may fan out different ways of looking at the text. Okay? So, I would quickly uh, you know, by way of re, uh, recap, a uh, recap of what we have done, I will quickly, uh, you know, uh, pose questions and then try and uh, give you an indication as to how to answer those questions. Okay? For instance, uh, let's go back to the beginning and uh, let's try and understand, right? Uh, how literary? You know, ask a question like this: How, um, for instance, how is a text like Shakespeare's Hamlet? Okay. Um, understood or approached from a cognitive point of view. Okay? So, how would you answer this question? Okay, we could answer this question by looking simply at one, you know, an important aspect of the text that is action, okay? action and uh, the lack of action or non-action. Okay? And we may say that well, uh, we know that uh, Hamlet's uh, de you know, the delay 
um, in the text of, of action of taking revenge okay, has been looked at from so many aspects from psychoanalytical aspects, from philosophical aspects, from political aspects. Okay. Uh, what is new here in this um, uh, way of looking at the text is we place the mind first at the center. Okay. We do not deny that Hamlet is a political being of course, that the text is definitely a political one or a very strong uh, you know a, a text that strongly lends itself to psychological or, or psychoanalytical criticism, but we say that the tragedy of Hamlet is not to be understood simply from a psychoanalytical perspective or from a political perspective. We argue that uh, understanding Hamlet through trying to understand the processes of his mind and remember there are two ways as Mary Crane uh, suggests. Okay, one is the obvious um, way of trying to understand the cognitive processes of his mind okay, uh, or, or even trying to explain his delay by, by referring to the speeches, okay, the soliloquies as I said the asides for instance which are as I said direct indicators of Hamlet's state of mind, but also as was suggested by the critic okay, at another level even if it is an indirect one the, the structure of the play, the organization of the plot also are, are if you look at them carefully indicators of the inner self of of Hamlet. Okay. For instance, the question, important question, how does the inner self, right? Uh, what is the dialogue of the inner self? What is the negotiation of the inner self okay, with external action, right, in a socio cultural setup, right, that we understand Hamlet from that point of view. Now, let us look at another question, so, simple question like what do we understand? Okay. First of all, what do we understand by cognitive? We know that by cognitive, we refer to, to, to uh, terms like attention, perception, learning, okay, memory, right. Uh, all these are part and parcel of the literary text and the reader of the literary text, okay. So much so that reader response criticism, okay, today is completely, you know, it is a, there is a huge change in reader response criticism from the kind of reader response criticism that was taught to us or we understood, I had understood from using theories of Ezer for instance, Wolfgang Ezer or uh, Stanley Fish, right. We are now looking at the processes that go on inside the reader's mind at both an individual and at a collective level. Okay, reader response criticism is hugely empirical today okay, as we carry out uh, tests on several uh, subjects uh, you know to understand different the varied ways in which a text may be responded to. Okay, by the, a reader, uh, by a reader, whether in, in you know in um, uh, in, a, in an individual way or in a community way, right? There are cross-cultural cognitive studies done on reader response, right? So, attention. Uh, the importance of memory, for instance, when you're reading a literary text, you try and understand what role memory plays as you understand a literary situation. Okay. Also identification with the character, for instance, how we cognitively identify with Hamlet, bringing back the old suggestion you know the uh, or uh, you know suggestion given by uh, and if I am not mistaken it was Coleridge I think who said that there is a Hamlet in all of us. Right. So, the, this is the new angle that is being brought in and third, third question, how is imagination? Uh, looked at in cognitive science and what are its implications for literary studies. Then we need to say that with cognitive sciences there is a new materialism which is not the materialism of Marxism, but it is the materialism <coughs> sorry a materialism that is uh, a biologic materialism and in that sense it suggests the end of you know I would say the final end really of Cartesian dualism where the mind is here the mind is seen as emanating from the body the imagination is biologic is biological is material okay it comes from the firing of neurons it is the mind is not separate from the body okay and the literary text and its creator uh, ha have to be understood in such terms. Finally, the final, the final question is um, um, what may we say a cognitive approach to literary studies was a reaction to and it has been suggested by, by several critics really that post structuralism deconstruction which are anti-humanist okay, in their approach uh, which are which try and understand um, 
you know literary creativity from the point of view of linguistic structures okay denying you know in a very fundamental way the authorship to a text saying uh, you know for instance i remember a, a quotation for you know for instance malarney the french poet was asked once um, who is speaking and malarney answered language is speaking this is a kind of uh, approach you find in post structuralism and deconstruction but as perhaps a reaction okay to uh, you know to such formulations as were given by deconstruction by post structuralism okay as a reaction to that as a reaction to the end of uh, reason of enlightenment thinking as was suggested by post modernism perhaps as a reaction and many critics have felt as a reaction to that to such fluidity uh, reaction to such you know unknowability perhaps this new materialism this biologic materialism was something that many critics uh, really uh, embraced many critics perhaps embraced with a sigh of relief okay that here now we have the tangible the material in place of the intangible and in the, in, in the in place of uh, an extreme relativity okay so there of course uh, so uh, uh, so much else to talk about this is just to give you and to end, to, to really end this course um, you know this um, uh, course that we've been with you uh, you know through 40 lectures and to uh, you know uh, show you that to show you in what direction literary criticism is now moving with of course the caveat that this is not uh, a reductionist way of looking at the text you know we take recourse to cognitive neurosciences and its findings to cognitive psychology to artificial in intelligence with the understanding the very important understanding that literary the literary text is not reducible okay to those domains the text the literary text and the literary author these are you know the author is reinstated so to speak okay and you look when you look at the text beautiful book like Shakespeare's Brain by Mary Crane for instance. Okay. Also through books like the literary mind, the mind you know liter literariness okay, is not a, you know a unique or, or it is not something that nobody possesses. Okay. A book like the literary mind would suggest that every mind is literary, the mind is literary in design in the first place. Okay. So, these are new things that have come up and I would uh, be very happy of if some of you uh, move your studies in, in that direction and really thank you so much even uh, you know um, on behalf of my colleague Professor Krishna Bora, we would like to um, you know thank you profusely for being with us and you know we really hope these lectures have been useful to you and uh, as, I, as, as I said you know, even uh, whether you are in the engineering uh, you know domain sciences and technology or you are in the humanities domain let us not make clear cut divisions and this last topic which is the cognitive approach to literature is, a, is such a beautiful clear example of interdisciplinarity and in that spirit let me end this course goodbye. Thank you.